Rick Ross. Just while Ruby's giving out some sermon notes, um, in his, there's a book called The Insanity of God. I don't know if any of you have read it. Uh, it's, it's an interesting book, <laughs> but uh, I refer to this book briefly because of Somalia. The, the guy that writes the book, it's about the persecuted church. It's a great book, it's worth the read, but he was uh, working in Somalia as a missionary and uh, very carefully at one stage, he, he, he had four Christian Somalis and they organized to have very secretly uh, a Lord's Supper, uh, basically himself. I can't remember if his wife was involved in these Somalis. And uh, they did it very secretly within, I think it was three months, it might have been six months, all those four Somalis were murdered because people found out that they'd take, partaken in the Lord's Supper. And... Um, but that creates an interesting dilemma for him, of course, you know, what he, he felt, I guess, responsible in some ways for their deaths. An interesting story. Great book if you can grab it from someone and read it. Um, the Insanity of God. And uh, strange title, I know, but it's, it's about how God builds his church through suffering and death and struggle. Well, let's bow in prayer. Almighty God, once again, we come to sit under the authority of your word. I pray you would teach those who need teaching, encourage those who need encouraging, rebuke and correct those who need rebuking and correcting, that we might do all for your glory through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now, now as a church, we don't have a Sunday school as such, but many Sunday schools and churches will act out the story from Luke 2 that Stephen read for us. And I guess if you were doing the casting for that and you're trying to work out who plays the big roles. So let's think of that if we did that with uh, those of us here this morning. Well, we need a young 14 or 15 or 16 year old girl to play Mary. Well, we've got a 14 year old girl, is it? Over here, can play Mary. We need a wise man, probably in about his thirties to play Joseph. Now. Um, so I'm going to pick on Shane for that job. Okay. <laughs> Wise, sensible man, thoughtful, as Matthew portrays him. We need uh, a baby. Well, we've got a baby, I think Hamish, but he's not here this morning, but he's only a few weeks old, so he could play the Lord Jesus. We need, uh, we need some shepherds. So, uh, and they've got to be able to sing. So I was thinking, well, Johnny fits that bill and Paul's not here, but he sings and Ruby and Simone uh, sing us. So, so we've got a choir. We need an angel of the Lord who frightens the, uh, the shepherds. I think Doug up in Darwin would do that with his big beard. Have you seen Doug? Okay. And uh, we need some shepherds. Well, Scott's uh, milking cows. It's close to being a shepherd, isn't it? <laughs> Stephen's got a few sheep and deer where he is. So uh, we're pretty well cast for everyone. And imagine we acted out this story uh, and you'd had to work out who's the most important actor in our play. Well, of course, the most important actor is God, isn't he? Like I've said often before, whether it's an Old Testament story or a New Testament story, always the big actor in the biblical story is God. And so I want to think you to think with me this morning about a God who loves to save. As you and I come to this Christmas story, a story that we know so well in many ways, and you think as a preacher, what can I say from this story? And, and again this morning, I don't want to look at the nuts and bolts of the story so much as try and paint the big picture. You know, there's lots of nuts and bolts you could look at in this story, couldn't you? For instance, it says, Joseph and Mary went up to Bethlehem. Now, they've come, remember, from Nazareth down in Galilee, uh, at sea level or even below sea level, you go up to Jerusalem because it's up in the hills. Remember, I've said this to you before, children, when you think of Israel, you think of it like this way. You've got the Mediterranean Sea on one side. You've got the Jordan River and Valley running down to the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea is the lowest place on the earth. And in the middle, you've got this, mount, this mountain range where Jerusalem is, and Bethlehem's on a mountain, and it's near Jerusalem. And so they literally go up, physically go up. 
Bethlehem itself. What does Bethlehem mean? Well, we had some, Stephen had some neighbours around last night and I was talking to uh, the, the guy and saying, I met Stephen when I think he was 14 years old uh, in Skipton. And Skipton's an old English word for sheep town. And if you go down to the Western District of Victoria, what do you see? You see grain and you see sheep. Now, remember when David was alive, what was he doing as a little boy? He was looking after the sheep. And what does Bethlehem mean? Well, in Hebrew, Beth means house. Uh, Lehem means bread, the house of bread. How do you get bread? You grow wheat. So David's father had wheat and he had sheep and he also had some cows because David took some cheese to his brothers when they were fighting Goliath. That's how David got to fight Goliath. So they were mixed farmers, we would call them, back in the ancient world, just like so much of the Western District. So there's lots of details in this story. But what I want to focus on is this big picture. And the big picture is this is a story about God who loves to save. God who's got his hands, hands, you might say, dirty in the world so that he might save those who have rebelled against him and who have defied him and become his enemies, as the scriptures make clear. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is that God is the God of time and history. It's amazing, isn't it? In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Now, I, I wrote some notes about that. Stephen said, I hope you've read them, so I don't want to fill in this. But I do want you to think about this. Think about the Bible story from Genesis to Revelation. And think again of that, that Bible story. I'm going to come back to this later on like great mountain peaks. There's moments in that story where you're going along on a journey and suddenly something happens that's like a mountain. And that's a critical moment in the story. And then you come down off the mountain and you go along sometimes for a few hundred years. And then there's another great mountain peak. And as you think of the biblical story, particularly the Old Testament one, those mountain peaks are often brought about by God through pagan kings. So think of the great mountain peak in Genesis that ends Genesis, the story of Joseph. Who's critical in the story of Joseph? Pharaoh, isn't he? Because one night he has these dreams and he doesn't understand them. And as a result of those dreams, jo Joseph is taken out of prison and becomes the de facto ruler of Egypt and the people of God end up in Egypt. And then you go along quietly, don't you, between Genesis, the end of Genesis chapter 50 and Exodus 1, 400 years roughly, where not much happens. And suddenly there's another mountain peak. And who causes that mountain peak? Pharaoh, a different Pharaoh, of course, 400 years later, but a pagan king nevertheless. And God uses that Pharaoh... And over the next couple of pharaohs over the next 80 years to bring about the exodus. And then you go along and there's many periods of quietness. There is another peak where God uses a godly king called David. And then the people go into exile. And how do they go into exile? Well, they go, the northern kingdom goes through a king called Sennacherib. And, and more important than Sennacherib is another king called Nebuchadnezzar who comes and destroys Jerusalem. And so you have these moments, great moments in the biblical story where God uses, strangely enough, pagan kings. And, of course, the other great one of is the return of the people from the exile. How does God do that? Through another king, Cyrus. And here you come to the most critical point of the story. And how does that story start? Caesar Augustus. Who is Caesar Augustus? Well, he's the great ruler of the Roman Empire, but he is just a human being under the authority and power of God. And it's interesting how God then has used in these great moments, because God's the God of history, as someone else much wiser than me said, history is his story, isn't it? And it's the story of him using the pagan kings to bring about his purposes. And notice how God's the Lord of time in this passage. Notice these words. In those days, that's very general, isn't it? And if you read the sermon notes, I doubt there was such the, the birth of Christ. We know it was before 4 BC. 
How do we know it was before 4 BC? Because that's when King Herod died. Back in Matthew, remember, Herod, the wise men go to Herod, and then Herod murders the, the little boys in, uh, in, in Bethlehem as he tries to kill Jesus. Well, that Herod died in 4 BC, so obviously Jesus was born before then. Notice then it goes on, it's quite interesting. And that the text says he went there with, in verse 5, with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her, for the baby to be born. The time came. In the fullness of time, God brought forth his son, is what the Holy Spirit writes in Galatians. That moment of time has been planned from God before the beginning of time. And it's been announced by God in Genesis chapter 3 that the crusher will come and destroy Satan. And the clock's been ticking down for some 4,000 years, and now you come to that exact moment where Jesus is born. Not a second late, not a second early. He's born at that time. And yet in some ways the Holy Spirit puts it very vaguely here, doesn't he? We don't know. What month it was, you know, great arguments in the church. And again, if you read the sermon notes, you can read about that there. I touched on it, not in depth, but it's there. When was Jesus born? Hi. And then notice the, what the angel says. But the angel said to them in verse 10, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people today. At this very day, at this very moment, the angel doesn't turn up a week later to announce the birth of Christ. It's this day. The angel is sent from heaven. The choir is sent from heaven. Right now, at this moment, how can all this come to pass? How can 4,000 years of history come down to this exact moment? Because God is the God of history and time. And, of course, that's critical not only as you look back, but as you look forward. We live in this strange year of 2020 with COVID and all its weirdness. That the critical matter for you and I is not COVID. It's the return of Christ, isn't it? The, the coming of Jesus is fixed in time. And interestingly enough, when you look at that biblical story, and I'm not trying to make a prophecy here or anything, and I could be completely screwballed at this moment, <laughs> all right? But God has used pagan kings to bring about his purposes, as I've tried to explain. One wonders how God's going to presumably do the same sort of thing as he brings the nations to an end and Christ's return to public uh, uh, revelation. God is the God of time and history. And you young people, it's important for you to get hold of this because what you've got to understand is your life is not an accident. God wanted you born in 2020 or 2021. You, you were born now and not in the 18th century or not in the 22nd century if, if Christ has not come by then. You were born when you were born, not by accident, chance, luck, bad luck or anything else, but because of the eternal purposes of the living God. And God expects you to live for him in the days and time and history in which he's put you. You, you can't live in the past. All right. You can't live in the future. You can only live for Christ now, and you're living for Christ now. You're called to live for Christ now because God is the Lord of history and the Lord of time. So you need to understand that in terms of where God has put you and what God wants you to do and how he wants you to respond to his word and how he wants you to serve him. Now, notice God's three Ps in this passage. Now, the first one's not obvious. God's not really into PR. He's not a human uh, resource department from heaven that's trying to make everybody happy and give them pay rises. But it's interesting, isn't it, when you think of God as the Lord of history and time, that it's Caesar Augustus who brings 
stability to the Roman Empire and what now historians refer to as the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Rome had been divided. Rome had been, uh, been fighting all sorts of battles, both externally and internally. And you can read all about that and, and the death of Julius Caesar and what followed and how Augustus came to power after that. And the bringing of Augustus to power brought about this great time of peace in the ancient world that was God's hand to bring the Messiah into the world and so that the gospel could go forward. If you go back a 100 years before when Jesus was born and he'd been born then, it would have been very difficult for the stories and acts, for instance, of of Paul's conversion and missionary journeys to take place because the world was in turmoil. The, the world was in constant war and, and, and there were constant battles and fights even within what was then the Roman Empire. But shift the time forward 100 years to what we're dealing with here and you have this Pax Romana. This is the God of history and time preparing the way for the gospel. And it's a reminder again that you and I live in days in which God is in control. Does God know about COVID? Yes, of course he does. Does God know about the suffering church in Somalia? Yes, of course he does. The Pax Romana might have been something that Caesar Augustus worked out with the Roman Senate and the Roman army, but he was doing the will of God just as much as Cyrus was doing the will of God when he sent the Jews back and told them to rebuild the temple back in Nehemiah and Ezra's day. But notice also what the angel says. I bring you good news of great joy, that of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of Christ, a saviour has been born for you. He is Christ the Lord. And then the choir begins to sing. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel. And what do they sing in verse 14? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. God loves to save. And at the heart of that salvation is peace. That is God is at war with mankind. Man started that war, of course. Adam and Eve started it in their sin and their rebellion back in Genesis 3. But what does Romans 5 say? While we were still enemies. What does Romans 1 say? The wrath of God right now is being poured out upon the world. You and I live in a world where there's hostility between man, men and women and boys and girls, and God. But here we see God's great love to say. God was under no constraint. God was under no pressure. God was under uh, no force to save. Yes, he'd made promises back in Genesis, and he was going to keep those promises. But when he made those promises, particularly the one in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve were cowering in fear, trying to hide from him. You remember initially before God calls them out to stand before his judgment seat, God didn't have to make the promise then that he would save them. God is a God who wants peace between himself and his creation. And as I've said to you a lot over the last few months, think here about the Trinity. What's going on in the Trinity? How is the Father talking to the Son and the Son talking to the Holy Spirit? He's doing it in love and joy and peace. There's no hostility in the Trinity, is there? There's no arguments between the Father and the Son. There's no the Holy Spirit saying, oh, I feel a bit grumpy today, Dad, so I don't think I'll go down there and help Ross Bright. We'll just let him struggle on by himself. <laughs> the, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity doesn't work like that. There is peace. There is harmony in the Trinity. And God wants to take that harmony, that peace, that exists in the Trinity and pour it out into your life to deal with your sin and to bring you into a harmonious relationship with himself. If you don't know Christ this morning, your relationship with God is fractured and broken and you stand guilty before a holy God and under his judgment and in dire need of forgiveness. 
And the story before you and I is that that's what God wants to do. God loves to save. Don't think about your sin. Think about the fact God loves to save. Yes, your sin is real. Your sin is serious. Whatever your sins are, and you and I all have them. You and I are conceived in sin, and then you have your actual sins. But the blood of Christ shows you that God is willing to save regardless of your sin. And when this choir is singing or saying, this, I once got told off by someone for saying angels sing, they maybe chant. Whether they sing or not is an interesting question. But here, notice it says they're praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. And to whom is favour rest? Now, depending on your English Bible, the NIV uses favor. The Greek word here is well-pleasing, with whom God, on whom God's favor rests or with whom God is well-pleased. Now, how can God be well-pleased with sinners? Romans 5 again. While we were yet enemies with God, Christ loved us and died. In other words, we're looking here towards the result of the gospel. That those whom God pours out the blood of Christ on to forgive their sins experience his peace, but more than peace, his blessing. Children, think of it this way. Maybe you've done something wrong, you know, and you've offended dad. You've uh, done that thing you weren't supposed to do. And maybe you're a bit scared that dad's going to get out the wooden spoon and apply the, you know, to the Board of Education, to the seat of learning. And, 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 and so you're a bit not sure. And Dad comes and he says, uh, well, who can, I'll, I'll, I'm going to pick on someone, but I won't do that. I'll pick on my grandson, John, because he has this experience on a number of occasions. <laughs> uh, Dad comes and says, okay, John, I told you not to do that. You've done that, but I forgive you. Peace, you see. But peace is not necessarily the same as blessing, isn't it? And then Dad says, come on, let's go, and I'm going to buy you, because one of his favourite meals is fish and chips. Let's go and get some fish and chips. That, that's that extra step, you might say, isn't it? It's one thing to have peace. It's another thing to have that real sense of blessing on whom God is well pleased with. And again, there's a lot more thought here, but let me give you one idea to think about and chew over lunch. Who does God say he is well pleased with in the New Testament? Well, the heavens open at the baptism. This is my son, my beloved son, with what? With whom I am well pleased. You see what's being said here when you really get down to the nuts and bolts? God the Father wants to treat you as he treats his son. How does he do that? By bringing you into a relationship with himself through the son, by including you and I in Christ. God's peace and God's blessing. Now notice what the angels say here. Here's a gift worth receiving. God loves to save. And the gift of salvation is to be preached to all nations. The scriptures are clear and it is being preached. Uh, uh, even in countries like Somalia and, and Eritrea, we were praying for the other day. And, and, and much of the Muslim world, but not just the Muslim world, North Korea and China and, and India and many other countries where the gospel is being rejected, the gospel is still being preached. And at the heart of that gospel, you read in verse, uh, put my glasses on, 11, Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. Now think of all the words that the angel could have spoken here. Some of them Stephen read to us from Isaiah 9. Wonderful, counsellor, prince of peace, mighty God, everlasting kingdom. There's many more. But the primary word the angel of the Lord speaks to the shepherds is what? Saviour. Jesus has come to save. He has come so that you might know the forgiveness of your sins and be restored to a right relationship with the Father. 
they had come to say. Now, it's interesting here because you read this word in the town of David, a saviour has been born for you. So let's, let's do something here. Of this word saviour in the Gospels, Jesus came to say, remember in Matthew, the angel appears to Joseph when Joseph's thinking of divorcing Mary and says, you will call his name Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. He will save his people from his sins. Jesus to the disciples said, I did not come to be served, but to be a servant, to give my life as a ransom for many. And yet when you actually come to this word saviour, how many times is it in the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that little word saviour. How many times would you think it's recorded in the Gospels? Well, you might be surprised to know it's only two, twice. Obviously once here, and strangely enough, or I shouldn't probably say strangely enough, by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, in John chapter 4, at the story of the woman of, the, of, of Samaria, of that sinful woman who comes to know Christ and then tells the town and but this is a critical idea that's obviously central to the scriptures. Jesus has come to save. And the question, ultimately, the, the one question that this passage forces upon you and I is this. Do you know Jesus Christ today as your savior? Do you really know that he belongs to you and that you belong to him? And parents, as you bring up your children in the nurture and discipline of the Lord, that's the critical thing. Yes, they need a good education, and it's great to see all these budding musicians up here and uh, all the other things, but, but this is the thing that matters more than anything else, isn't it? That your children, by the grace of God, come to know Jesus as their saviour. <clears throat> children, that's the question for you and your teenagers, mum and dad. No, Christ is their saviour. That's why they're bringing you up in the church. That's why you're teaching them the scriptures. But you need to come to know their saviour as your own saviour. You need to come to know the Lord Jesus as the one who saves. And this saving work of Jesus is set out in those other two phrases that's there before you, aren't they? Today in the town of David, David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Christ, of course, is just the Greek word for Messiah, the anointed one. And when you read your Old Testament, you'll never understand that word without the depth of the Old Testament. But what's being said to you is that Christ is God's anointed one, the one who's promised, that's, that's looked forward to in the Old Testament, the ones to come, the one who has the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon him. And because he's the anointed one, he can do what no one else can do. And that is he can save. He can save men and women and boys and girls from their sin. And he is the Lord. He is the one who rules and reigns. And again, you know, you see the wisdom of the, the Holy Spirit, don't you, and the little nuances of the story. How does the story start? In these, those days, in the days of who? Caesar Augustus, Lord Augustus. Lord Augustus is on the throne in Rome. And he's made a proclamation. But the real Lord is lying in a feeding trough in an inn, in a stable, or probably, you know, house up here, underground and outground where they kept the animals. The one good thing being a Jewish one, it didn't have pigs in it at least. So it didn't smell of, of pigs, it smelled of animals, chooks and cows and sheep. Here's the real Lord. It's not Augustus who's on the throne. It's the one in the cradle. On that great day of judgment, Augustus is going to have to bow the knee before Jesus. For Jesus is the Lord. He's the saviour. He's the one who reigns. God loves to save. And we see that in the great stories of the Bible. I want to go back to these three big peaks. BME, easy, beginning, middle, end, isn't it? 
What's at the beginning? It's the story of creation and the fall. That's the first big peak in the scriptures. Of course, if there was no creation, you and I wouldn't be here. We for, don't for a moment accept the evolutionary uh, theory that uh, produces a world without God. There is a God who spoke and he spoke into being from nothing and into nothing the universe that you and I are a part of. And of course, part of that story is the tragedy of the fall, Genesis 1 to 3. It stands together. You can't read Genesis 1 and 2. You must read Genesis 1, 2 and 3. That's the first great mountain. And at the end of that great mountain peak or the top of it, you might say, as you plummet down from the fall, you, you bounce back up to that great promise. There will come Satan, one who's going to crush your head the beginning. But here we are at the middle, aren't we? And the, and the middle and somewhere, as, as Johnny prayed before, it's the most critical point in this time because it's the coming of the Savior and his coming to die. And it's the one story of the Messiah of his birth and his death and his resurrection and his ascension. And that's at the heart of the biblical story. And that's the, the point that confronts you and I the most right now in time. How this story impacts on you and I. What is this story, this biblical story, right at the middle of this biblical story, the heart of this biblical story, how is it affecting your life today? How is it dominating your thinking? That's the great challenge again to those of you who are parents and us old geezers like Ronnie and Lisa that are grandparents. How can we bring this story home to our children in such a way that it impacts their life? Teaching them and praying for them and setting them a godly example. And then the end, of course, this biblical story, you and I are caught up in it now. Now, Scripture's not being written anymore from that point of view, but, but you and I are very much part of the story from Genesis 1 on. You're here, as I already said, young people, because God is the God of history and time, and he has determined that you would be conceived and be born right now and that you would live your life right now with all its blessings. You know, it's hard to imagine, but when I was your age, I'd never heard of McDonald's, never heard of the word computer. We had typewriters, admittedly. Probably some of you don't know what a typewriter is, but uh, we had them back then. Um, maybe Doug didn't and Darwin. Oh, thank you, Stephen. But we, you and I are caught up in this biblical story right now. And that story is going to come to an end. It's not an open-ended story that goes on. In one sense, it does in heaven and eternity. But in terms of this earth, it's going to end. It's going to end with the return of Christ. Whether that's today or in another thousand years, only God the Father knows. But it's going to end. And you need to understand that story and where you fit into that story. Now, notice that as this part of the story comes to a close, we're told at the end there. In verse 20, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which they were just as they had been told. Well, there's a sermon in that, but what do the shepherds do? They worship. Their response to the message of God and what they experience and how the word of God to them has been proved true is to worship. And that is always an appropriate place and response to the word of God, isn't it? A true response to the word of God will always involve your worship. Even if you're not a Christian and God puts you under conviction of sin and brings you to the cross and to the blood of the lamb, then why deal with your sins? Your confession of sin starts with worship of God. And part of true worship involves always, even for Christians, ongoing confession of sin. But here the, the worship is primary exaltational. They're glorifying and praising God. And as a church, we need to be involved in that and, and as families. 
it's interesting, and I'm going to get got to got to wind up, but it's interesting. One of the great sins in the Bible is grumbling, and I have to confess that I do my have have done my part of that, and because grumbling is the opposite of exaltation, isn't it? And, and you put your tongue to use every day. And you've got to ask yourself at the end of the day, if I put my tongue to use to grumble and to complain and to whinge and moan, or if I put my tongue to use in exaltation and glorification of God. But notice, and this comes up next week again with Mary. If you read on into the story, you see a similar phrase in verse 19, uh, later on in the chapter, but in verse 19, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The biblical story, beginning, middle, and end, is about your heart. Christ is the one, and we're going to see this next week, who deals with the heart. The coming of Christ means Christ is the great revealer of hearts. We see that in the persecuted church, don't we? As Christians give their hearts to Christ, others rebel against the gospel and unbelief and wickedness, and their own hearts are exposed by their hatred of the gospel and their persecuting of the church. This isn't just a story about a young girl having a baby and it's a bit sad because they're a bit poor and they don't have a lot of money and and they end up in the wrong place when the baby's born. It's a story about your heart and my heart. It's a story about Jesus, who is the saviour of the world because his father wants to save. It's a story about your sin and my sin and the blood of Christ that's shed on the cross. And the story ultimately brings us back to where Mary is this morning. Mary treasures up this in her heart. She ponders it. She thinks about it. Her heart's already been revealed earlier in chapter one when she says to the angel, if this is what the Lord wants for me, then so be it. I will accept lovingly, graciously God's will in my life. So as we finish, as I finish this story, and remember this is about the death and resurrection of Christ, his blood shed for sinners and your own sin. The question for all of us, for myself, myself and for you, is where is your heart this morning? What is gripping your heart? What is driving your life? What is the deepest seated motivation in your life? Where is your heart? Is your heart in heaven and belonging to Christ? Or is it still attached to sin and to idols and to false gods? Where is your heart? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this story, a story of salvation, a story of hope, a story of forgiveness, a story of renewal, a story of a home in heaven for those who deserve the everlasting fires of hell. Oh, Lord, what a story. We read so many things on the news and the internet these days. People all have a story to tell, but no story is as great as this story. And we bow then in worship and praise and humility and in thankfulness. And above all, we say thank you that this little babe went to the cross, shed his blood, rose from the dead. And now, Lord Jesus, you reign in glory and splendor. And from there you will come to judge the living and the dead. We pray this in the name of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ross. Very good. Worship. Worship with our hearts. Worship with our lives. Right. Let's sing another Christmas song and we'll sing Joy to the World. Please be upstanding. <laughs>
sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat it, repeat the sounding joy. Sorrow the chains and sorrows grow, the thorns which raise the ground, he comes to is bound, far as the curse is bound, far as, far as the curse is bound. He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations great. The glories of his righteousness and wonders of his eyes. 